generic, focusing on a sort of general understanding of how different areas of the brain are involved in a variety of different functions. Here we're going to examine some of the data indicating that at least in some ways the brains of males and females are different. So finally, we're going to talk about sex. Well, human sexuality and how it's expressed in particular cultures is a very, very complicated subject. And we'll come back to this a little bit later. Biologists, however, generally break it down into various categories. And they're obviously interrelated in most individuals. But these categories would include genotypic sex. So genotypic sex is determined by the inheritance of either two X's or an X and a Y chromosome. And this determines how the development of the embryonic gonads takes place. These are the sex organs. They differentiate either to an ovary or into a testis. And this is determined at conception. So genotypic sex is determined at conception and depends on whether the father contributes an X or a Y to the fetus. So when you hear things about Henry VIII and how he beheaded and killed all those wives because they didn't have any little male children, we now know that that doesn't make any sense because it was Henry who contributed all those X's, okay, that resulted in all the female children that he had. At any rate, the next type of category of sex that biologists generally make is phenotypic sex. And this is determined by the development of internal and external genitalia. So obviously, genotypic sex and phenotypic sex are generally related. I have to tell you, however, there are disorders in which, for one reason or another, genotypic sex and phenotypic sex are not the same. So they don't always occur normally together. And in human beings, we also have something else, and that's called gender identification. And this is determined by the subjective experience or perception of one's own sex. So the latter is a construct created by the brain related to one's perceived sexual identity. So this is a construct created by the individual related to which sex they identify with. Now, what we have found out in neuroscience, and we think that gender identification is more related to this, neuroscience has in fact found another category. It's revealed another category of sex called brain sex. And brain sex means that the actual structural and thus likely to be functional differences in the way brains are organized in male and female may in fact relate to differences in how males and females relate to their environment and also gender identification. The differentiation into two forms, so we say a male and a female form, is referred to as sexual dimorphism of the brain. So what does it mean to say that a nucleus or an area of the brain is sexually dimorphic? Well, what it means is that somehow an individual nucleus or a structure is different in the size, the number, or the density of neurons. So a particular area may be different in males and females depending on the number of neurons found in that area. An area is sexually dimorphic if the connections between it and another area are different between males and females. Or you could have a difference in the expression of particular molecules and receptors, for example, in different structures of the brain in males and females. Now, what is important here is this. There's a lot of variability in every one of our brains, so all of our brains aren't exactly the same. So if we looked in any structure, we would, if we looked at a group of females, for example, there'd be a certain amount of variation in that structure among that group of females. If we looked in males, the same would be true. So when we're talking about sexual dimorphism, we're seeing that the differences between males and females are much greater than the differences that exist within either of the groups. So these structures are very different, different enough that in some cases, any trained scientist could immediately look at a section of the brain 
through particular areas and would be able to tell you whether that suction came from the brain of a male or the brain of a female. So we're talking about pretty big differences here. Now, we assume that the differences in structure or molecular structure or gross overall structure play a role in how that nucleus operates or works. So we think that this underlies difference in function, uh, which is, we'll, we'll get to some of the functional data here in a minute. Now, before we talk about the areas of the brain that are involved, let's turn our attention to what induces sexual dimorphism in the brain. This is just a really, really interesting area. So first of all, originally in development, the central nervous system of the fetus is equipotential for developing either brain sex. So it doesn't make any difference whether you have two X's or an X and a Y. Your brain is equipotential for developing into the brain sex of either male or female. So what happens in the male brain? What happens in the male brain? Well, normally in males, the immature testes produce a tiny amount of testosterone. And this testosterone is going to masculinize the male sex organs. It will also cause the regression of uh, some of the tissues in the body that would have developed into female structures. And in addition, it plays a role in masculinizing the male brain. Actually, minute amounts of testosterone will enter the brain and will actually get inside the neurons in particular structures of the brain. And only those structures will then develop and become sexually dimorphic. So the testosterone only enters particular structures in the brain. What is interesting here is that once the testosterone is inside of these neurons, it in fact um, is converted to estradiol, which is an estrogen. And it is actually that estradiol that masculinizes the male brain. Thus, in the presence of estradiol, those particular neurons in the brain become male in their pattern of the neurons, how the neurons are packed, and in their connections with other structures. So what happens in female fetuses? Well, let's think about this. Since it's estrogen that actually masculinizes the male brain, why isn't the female brain made masculine by the high levels of estrogen that circulate in the mother? Well, it turns out that circulating in the bloodstream are actually proteins that bind estrogen. But I want you to think about this. Even in males, it isn't circulating estrogen that masculinizes the brain. It's the conversion within certain groups of neurons just the conversion within certain groups of neurons from testosterone that is critical, that results in a male brain. So this is what is involved. Testosterone in males must enter certain cells and there be converted into estrogen. So it's not circulating estrogen that does it. So in the female brain. In females, what you have is the absence of a certain level, which is tiny, that certain level of testosterone causes the brain to develop on a female pattern. The female pattern of brain development is in fact the default pattern in the brain. So in a sense, it's like a computer program. In the absence of additional information, a brain will develop along a female pattern. Now, what happens in the little developing male fetus who doesn't produce enough testosterone. And this does happen. If those little gonads don't produce enough testosterone, so there isn't enough to get into the brain and thereby be converted within certain groups of neurons into estradiol, that male will develop a female brain. In females, in female fetuses, if for some reason the mother is producing a high level of androgens in her bloodstream, if the mother is exposed to certain kinds of steroids, if the mother takes particular drugs like barbiturates during pregnancy, or we now know if the mother is exposed to high levels of pesticides 
all of these things will masculinize female brains. So that means that a female fetus whose mother is exposed to certain things, that fetus will be exposed to androgen, that will in fact masculinize her brain. So this is a very, very important and interesting area of research. Now, the brain becomes sexually dimorphic during a critical period or window of time. And we've seen critical periods talked about before. So for different kinds of things that occur developmentally, there are different critical periods. So depending on what we're talking about, it could be a different critical period of time. And in this case, the critical period for humans for sexual dimorphism of the brain occurs before birth. So that means that from that point on, brain sex is determined. There is nothing that can change it. And it means that puberty, the circulating male and female hormones that uh, circulate as a result of reaching puberty, already act on a brain that's already sexually dimorphic. And so this is a very critical part about it. Brain sex cannot be changed and it's determined before birth, at least in human beings. So what is the evidence of sexual dimorphism of the brain? What is the evidence that this is true? And as with other questions that we've looked at in this course, we're going to look at experimental data from animals and also look at clinical research and from the clinic and how that can inform us about this. Most research in the area is done on rats, and there's actually a reason for that. The critical period for sexual dimorphism in the rat is postnatal, so it occurs after birth. And this means that as scientists, we can manipulate the hormonal environment during the critical period much easier than we could if it occurred in utero. So rats are a wonderful model for this. They're also a wonderful model because the behavior of rats is very sexually dimorphic. So that means adult male rats engage in mounting behavior and certain kinds of behaviors that are very different than adult females. Female rats, um, when they're sexually excited, exhibit something called lordosis, which means the rear part of the body moves up and their tail moves out of the way. And female rats also engage in nest building activity. So you have an animal in which its adult behavior is also very clearly dimorphic. So you can watch their behavior very carefully. And when you manipulate them or you manipulate this critical period, you can see what happens or how this plays out. So that's it. they're a very, very um, good model for studying this. So what happens if we manipulate the hormonal environment of a male or a female rat during their critical period right after birth when their brains are going to become sexually dimorphic. Note that the animals um, that we manipulate, we can determine what their genotypic and obviously phenotypic sex are. So let's imagine that we take a female rat pup and we give them testosterone during the critical period. Now, these animals are females genotypically and phenotypically. If we manipulate by giving testosterone during that critical period and never give testosterone again, as adults, those females engage in mounting behavior. They act as males, not as females. If we take little male pups and we castrate them during the critical period, now remember, it's the critical period that's, that's important, not if you do anything any other time, but that critical period. If you castrate little male pups during their critical period, as adults, they show lordosis when they're approached by males, and they also engage in nesting building or nesting behavior. So they act consistent with their brain sex. Uh, when I was a student... Um, there was this incredible film that was just hysterically funny. And there were three rats who were the stars of this little film, rat pornography we used to call it. And there was one rat named Bob 
and I, he was one color, and he was genotypically, phenotypically, and his brain sex were all male. So that was Bob. And then there was Susie, and she was genotypically female, and phenotypically and brain sex was all consistent. And she was another color. And then there was a little rat named Ralphie. And Ralphie was genotypically and phenotypically male, but he had a female brain. So he had been manipulated, and he was a multicolored rat. And this film showed these three rats interacting with each other, and Ralphie very confused. Um, the other male rat getting upset when Ralphie behaved certain ways and Ralphie getting upset when the male rat behaved certain ways. And it showed the little Ralphie over in the corner building a nest while the other rats were having sex. It was, it was just a very funny film. And so, <laughs> and I'm sorry I don't have a copy to show you. But the critical thing here, the most important thing to take home is that as adults, if you manipulate hormonal environment in rats during their critical period, as adults, they will behave consistent with their brain sex. This is what guides their behavior, so that's what's most important. Now, it also tells us something else, and I think that this is very important to understand. Both male and female genotypes and phenotypes are compatible with either brain sex type. So you could be a genetically male or female person and have a brain of the opposite sex and is perfectly compatible with it. Now, sexual dimorphism also occurs in human beings, but the critical period is before birth. So this is the difference. Again, we are born with a brain that is either male or female. This cannot be altered by experience. It's due to the hormonal environment that existed or did not exist during female development or fetal development. So what areas of the brain have been shown to be sexually dimorphic? Well, this is just a few of them. Areas of the hypothalamus. So it turns out that the hypothalamus is one of those areas, remember, controls autonomic nervous system and also controls hormonal um, events that take place in the body. It controls mating, courtship, sexual behavior. So it makes sense that there are specific nuclei in the hypothalamus that would be different in males and females. In all animals, there are things that are different about male and female sexual behavior, and so that's reflected in the hypothalamus. Note, however, that the other areas up here that are sexually dimorphic, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and some cortical areas, including this orbital frontal cortex that we talked about in a previous lecture, are all areas that are sexually dimorphic. They're all limbic system areas, and they involve processing of memory and emotion. So, and play a role, obviously, in executive function, just as we talked about this orbital frontal cortex being involved in the abstraction of moral behavior. So these are three areas that are also sexually dimorphic. So a lot of work being done on the hippocampus because in adult females, the hippocampus has a huge number of receptors that bind estrogen. And it turns out that when these receptors in adult females bind estrogen, it causes spines to increase and dendrites to grow. So remember we were talking about plasticity? This is one of the plastic responses. And as women go through their cycle monthly, what happens, there are changes in the hippocampus, in spines, and in the dendritic branches of hippocampal neurons. So this is an area people are very interested in. There are differences in the amygdala, which indicates that we respond differently to emotional stimuli. Now, there are also differences between the male and female brains in the way information in general is processed by the brain. And this is something that has also been of great interest to neuroscientists and psychologists. So, for example, the male brain pattern results in an earlier and a stricter hemisphere lateralization. So we talked about hemisphere lateralization. We have two hemispheres. We have a right hemisphere and a left hemisphere. 
and that in most individuals, for example, the left hemisphere is specialized for language. And there are other things that are specialized as well, but this has been best studied in language. It turns out that in young males who have left hemisphere damage, little boys who have left hemisphere damage, may forever have difficulties in speaking or understanding language. And in fact, more males and females suffer from dyslexia. Um, more males than females have trouble reading in school and other things related to language. Now, it turns out that in females, in a small young female child, if the left hemisphere is damaged, the right hemisphere will take over the functions for language. And so as an adult, you may not even be able to tell that that individual ever had brain damage. And this is true even as adults. Males who have strokes on the, in the left hemisphere that involve language have difficulty of being able to recover from the stroke, whereas females recover language ability very readily. When you look with functional MRI, what you see is that the female brain seems to retain a certain equipotentiality. So the male brain's strict lateralization very early on, that's a result of sexual dimorphism, works against the male for recovering from damage to one hemisphere or the other for functions that are very strictly lateralized. Now, there's some evidence also that even the corpus callosum may be a little different between males and females. And you remember the corpus callosum are these group of fibers which go this way that connect homotopic parts in both of the hemispheres. So it turns out that when you um, ask females to solve certain types of problems, they utilize parts of both of their hemispheres in solving the problems. Whereas the same problem may be, in fact, solved in males by the use of only one hemisphere or the other hemisphere. So we think that perhaps there's a difference either in the hemisphere lateralization of males and females that contributes to this or in the corpus callosum fibers. Now, there are other findings that suggest there are differences in behaviors between males and females that are also likely to be related to sexual dimorphism of the brain. There's accumulating evidence, and in fact, a lot of evidence, to suggest that females in general, and that this occurs shortly after birth, that you can actually measure this difference between males and females. That females are better at being able to read faces and to hear in the tone of voice changes in emotional expression. So even as infants, female children are more attuned to facial expression and tone of voice. And that this occurs, or can at least be measured, immediately after birth. So women in general read faces better. Now you remember that the amygdala was one of those structures. Remember the amygdala is involved in the pro fast processing of uh, events that have a very strong emotional content? Well, it turns out that on tests of emotional memory, women always score higher than men do. So these are overall scores, of course. But women apparently have a much better emotional memory for things. Also, if you have males and females, and you look with functional MRI to look at what areas are activated, when there's conflict, for example, in some kind of image that's being shown to males and females, the amygdala is more likely to be activated in females than in males during signs of conflict. What is interesting is viewing conflict seems to cause testosterone to be secreted in males that is bound to particular brain structures, and that doesn't occur in females. So the way information is being processed and how it will obviously be dealt with on some level or processed by the brain at least is very different in males and females. Now finally, while there are no overall differences between males and females in IQ. And while male brains are larger than female brains, when you take into account body size and also packing density, there are no 
uh, significant differences between the sexes in the number of neurons. Even though this is true, that doesn't mean that males and females don't have different strengths. So, for example, females appear overall to show enhanced language ability and empathy, or ability to read emotion in other people, and also to have a superior emotional memory. Males, on the other hand, are clearly superior in spatial ability and in their ability to build systems. And so we're trying to learn how this lateralization of the brain or dimorphism in particular areas might lead to these different strengths that seem to exist in males and females. Now, on top of the native differences that might exist, cultures around the world typically exaggerate the differences between males and females. So it's like the differences between us become exaggerated, and particularly for whoever's in charge of establishing rules in the culture, makes uh, the behavior, for example, of males very clear about what's acceptable, but also for females, what's acceptable behavior. And so it makes the differences greater. Also, uh, we have to realize that cultures assign values. So let's, let's take one example because I think it's a good one. Uh, in our culture, little boys have more trouble learning how to read. But in our culture, we also value education. We value reading. So many schools, there are many programs that are designed specifically to help little boys learn how to read better. So the brain is still plastic. You can't change brain sex, but that doesn't mean it's not plastic and that you can't help someone achieve another level by a directed input. Notice what happens when little girls aren't very good at math, though. There aren't very many special programs to help them be better at math, to try to develop spatial abilities. So it doesn't mean, even if we have strengths, it doesn't mean that something can't be done that couldn't help us be better. It also doesn't mean that there aren't men who don't have a lot of empathy or that there aren't women who aren't good at spatial uh, concepts or systems building. It means that overall, when you look, there are different strengths between males and females. So finally, what is the evidence that sexual dimorphism of the brain influences human behavior such as the choice of a sexual partner as an adult? And this is something, you know, a lot of people are very interested in. A very famous uh, neuroscientist was one of the individuals who looked in the homosexual male brain and the heterosexual male brain in one of these areas in the hypothalamus. And indeed, it was dimorphic between those two groups and that in homosexual males that nucleus was organized more like the female brain. We're not really sure what this nucleus does in humans though so it's very hard for us to tell whether or not or how that plays out in the expression of sexual behavior. So to do that I think a better example is to look at actual clinical disorders in which the genotype and phenotype and the brain sex are not the same. Because I think this informs us on a different level. And there is such a disorder, and this disorder, there are many of them actually. This is one of them, and this is called adrenal hyperplasia. And individuals who have this disorder are genotypically and phenotypically female. So they are definitely females. But during their critical period of development, their adrenal gland, which is located above the kidneys, was making too much androgen. So it was producing male hormone, and thus their brain was masculinized. Now, these individuals who have this disorder, a huge group of them have been studied and followed over many years of their lives. And if you look at them, number one, They are more likely to behave as tomboys as children. They engage in very rough, aggressive behavior that's typically associated with males, although little girls can be pretty rough too. But they identify with males even when they're very young. They identify with boys and identify with the kinds of activities that boys typically participate in. And probably even more importantly, 
they show a significantly increased preference for choosing other females as sexual partners as adults. And so this is a clinical disorder um, in which clearly the brain sex is different from the genotyping and phenotypic sex, and so this plays out. Now, in conclusion, I think that most neuroscientists would agree that there are differences between the sexes in the body, we all would agree with that, and that that would also include the brain. I don't know any neuroscientists who don't think that the brains of males and females are sexually dimorphic. We also think there's a sexual dimorphism in the mind in a sense, since the brain is the biological substrate of the mind, okay? And lastly, we think that there are differences in behavior Although the role of culture and how that influences how the behaviors and how they are expressed is obviously very important too. I think that we can stand back from this and we can say that the scientist doesn't put a value on it. It doesn't say that the male brain or the female brain is better. It doesn't make evaluation. What it says is that the brains are different and we have this incredible ability to interact with one another and to appreciate a very different perspective, particularly in how emotions are processed in the brain and how these emotions play out in our behavior, because these are the areas that show the greatest dimorphism. We also can be able, in physicians, in the medical community, be able to use this material. Some fraction of babies is born with what is called ambiguous genitalia, And that means that by surgery, they can either be made into a little girl or made into a little boy. And parents are typically asked to make this decision only a few days after birth. If we can gain an understanding of whether that baby has a male or a female brain, we can make sure that the surgery will match the two appropriately. So this is not just basic science. This is information that can help people's lives um, in a a very, very real way. And not to mention that sex is just an interesting subject anyway. Thank you.